Hey, Glorious Geeks. I hope you all had a fabulous Labor Day weekend and that those of you with kids are feeling some freedom again. My two boys are staying home since I have a young baby, so I'm really feeling revived, re-energized, and just so excited to start the school year. Before we start, you know what to do. You'll make my day by hitting the subscribe button, following us, and liking this video. Unlike most of our allies we've pissed off, we've still managed to remain good friends with Japan. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe resigned a couple weeks ago due to a bad relapse and ulcerative colitis. President Trump called him the greatest prime minister in Japan's history, and so I thought I'd explain what makes him important. Abe was prime minister for eight years, which is really long for that position. He helped Japan recover from a huge earthquake and tsunami, and he also secured the 2020 Summer Olympics for Tokyo. He had a program called Abenomics, through which he revived Japan's economy and boosted consumer confidence. I actually have a similar program like that called Hagaronomics that my husband loves. It's why I support the economy by shopping nonstop. What I find most interesting, and unlike a lot of non-dictators, was that he was able to make friends with President Trump, which ultimately helped him keep U.S.-Japanese trade and the U.S.-Japanese military relationship in a good spot. Abe also tried to change the Japanese work culture and empower women, but he didn't really finish that goal. Did you know that office etiquette there dictates that women have to wear high heels to work all the time? All the time. I mean, here people are lucky if they change out of their flip-flops. Abe lived in a prickly corner of the world, but still managed to warm up Japan's relationship with the Chinese president before that guy became Dr. Evil. And he also held up an important trade agreement with the Pacific countries. All this allowed Abe to give Japan a more prominent role on the international stage and to further strengthen the relationship with the US. When I was in government, we worked really closely with the Japanese in national security efforts. Now Abe doesn't exactly leave at the best time because he's been accused of corruption and his ratings are low because of how he handled the coronavirus and how that undid a lot of Japan's economic progress. So his successor definitely has their work cut out for them. But one thing's for sure, whomever the parliament appoints next week will also likely be a friend of the United States. Last week, US fighter jets intercepted six Russian military jets off the coast of Alaska, which believe it or not happens a lot more often than you'd think. What's interesting is that this activity has increased significantly, with the U.S. having to intercept these planes over a dozen times this year. I don't want to sound like Sarah Palin, but apparently you can see Russia from Alaska on a good day, so maybe they should learn to be a better neighbor. The U.S., U.K., and the NATO countries that border Russia and Europe actually have these kind of stare-down matches all the time. First, because Russia in many instances is doing training and exercises in the event of a real war. Second, because Russia likes to flex its muscles to continue looking like a threat and deter the U.S. and others from taking aggressive action. It's kind of like Russia is trying to look like a hurly-burly bodyguard. But the third reason is the most important and is exactly why I wanted to cover this story. Because the more intercepts Russia causes and the more they try to expand their military presence globally, the more they could end up desensitizing our military and even regular Americans to their presence. So think about it. This event was barely covered, in part because our press barely covers world news anymore, but also because this activity has become so commonplace that it doesn't really seem that important. Why cry wolf when it doesn't seem like a wolf, right? except one day when the wolf could bite. That's actually really scary when you're talking about Russian bombers flying near your borders, which do pose a real threat. So far, it looks like our military is on it, but when it comes to Russia, we gotta keep watching them closely. Protests in Germany have gotten a little wild lately and also frankly a little insane. Like, oh my world, what on earth is happening insane? Thousands have been protesting in Germany against pandemic restrictions, but no one really knows what they're specifically protesting since a lot of the restrictions in Germany have been lifted. And here's the crazy part. These protesters include ordinary people along with far-right extremists, anti-vaxxers, and conspiracy theorists, many of whom seem to be inspired by President Trump and the American far-right conspiracy theory QAnon. The irony is that Germany has been praised for how it handled the coronavirus. Their boss lady leader, Angela Merkel, does not mess around, and because of her policies, Germany has had one of the lowest COVID death rates. But now you have these protests, and they're large, and they're kind of aggressive, and now they've just become plain bizarre. Many of them are holding Nazi-era or QAnon flags, and a large group of them nearly stormed the parliament building. There are even protesters carrying signs asking President Trump and Russian President Putin to, quote, liberate Germany, whatever on earth that means. None of this makes any sense. I love me some foreign leaders, but I would never ask them to take over my country. Except maybe Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. But my guess is that Melania has already asked him that. There are two interesting aspects to these protests. First, why do President Trump and QAnon appeal to these protesters? Some of them said it's because Trump knew from the very beginning that the virus was a hoax. Well, I guess they didn't read Bob Woodward's latest book. The reason that's bad is because the last thing we want to project to the world as Americans is that A, we're ignorant about a deadly virus, or B, that we support white supremacy. And the second reason these protests matter is because it reflects a truly worrying trend that people in democratic countries increasingly don't trust their governments and mainstream media. And if that trend continues, then it becomes a real concern for things to come. 
Have you guys seen the movie Hotel Rwanda? It's an amazing film about a guy named Paul Rusesa Bagina, who helped save over 1,200 lives by hiding Rwandans in his hotel during the 1994 Rwandan genocide, which resulted in 800,000 deaths in only 100 days. This guy received the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom for his bravery. Well, Rusesa Bagina flew from the U.S. to the UAE last week and hours later mysteriously boarded a private plane to Rwanda, where he then appeared with handcuffs and has been accused of terrorism. Rwanda's president said that Rusesa Bagina voluntarily got on that plane, but that seems pretty unlikely given that he's a very loud critic of Rwanda's president, who's known for brutally repressing political dissidents. For years he's been after Rusesa Bagina, who's a citizen of Belgium and a legal resident of the U.S. Many have come out calling for his release or for a fair and legal trial, but the Rwandan president is not exactly a guy known for fair trials. The thing that's the most terrifying in this scenario is the fact that Rusesa Bagina was likely abducted. And unfortunately, the Rwanda Rwandan president is not alone in trying to capture, kill, or intimidate his citizens abroad who criticize him. Saudi Arabia and Russia are also known to hunt down dissidents and activists who flee abroad for their safety. And if you ask me, the country those guys flee to for safety need to do a better job of preventing dictators from extending their reach. If we don't say anything or react strongly enough, then authoritarian leaders will feel free to hunt down their opponents anywhere. I'm not afraid to say that that's not acceptable behavior. And for that reason, the Rwandan president is on my list this week. Twenty has been filled with really tragic news due to this pandemic, and so I'm especially excited to share some great news about Africa beating the wild polio virus. This is a super dangerous and sometimes deadly virus, but it is entirely preventable because there's a vaccine. So nearly three decades ago, decades ago South African President Nelson Mandela made a call to kick polio out of Africa. A group, including the American CDC, partnered together to vaccinate children across Africa and finish this disease once and for all. Before that, 75,000 African children a year were being paralyzed by polio, but this program gathered millions of health workers who went village to village to hand deliver vaccines. By the way, I kind of want to go vaccinate kids in Africa when I grow up. Ultimately, it's this program that helped eradicate this virus, and today, roughly 220 million children across Africa are immunized against polio every year. Especially in these times when the world is suffering from COVID and when we're all praying for a vaccine, paging my boyfriend, Dr. Fauci, the idea that there was a virus causing such a horrific disease when a vaccine exists is just crazy. The coolest part about this is that you help pay for it since U.S. taxpayer dollars went to support this program, which shows you the good that America does around the world. Here's hoping we crush another virus this year too. I'm so happy we could end on such a good note, and I'm so lucky to have you guys geek out with me. I also want to let you know that I've launched something called OMW's Q of the Day. So if you ask me a question on social media, I'll get back to you and give you a shout out if you do. You got a question? We got an answer. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and like this video. Leave me a comment or question and please follow Oh My World and Me on Instagram and Twitter. Stay fabulous, geeks. Oh, <laughs>